Hello, I'm Renee Coach Scheidt, and we're going to be looking today into God's Word for our Bible study class here at First Baptist Church. And I'm honored and so appreciative to have this chance to share God's Word. We're going to start a brand new book of the Bible today. It is the Song of Solomon. Now, there is a reason why God has this in the Bible. It is a very poetic book. It is difficult. It has metaphors that we don't use today, but uh, it is basically a love story of a young man and woman who long for each other, who get married, who have a disagreement, and then they go on and have their marriage relationship. So, Let's get into it. The reason I said that there is a reason it's in the Bible is because <clears throat> God would not have put it there without it being purposeful. But th there are some things in it that might make you blush. Warning, viewer discretion <laughs> is advised. This is not for the faint of heart because it's going to use some sexual language that we don't expect to hear in church. If you've never read the book of Solomon, do so because you'll say, wow, I never knew the Bible said that. So uh, let's get into it. Now, let me give you some background material. Obviously, the author is Solomon. We see that in verse one. Solomon was the son of David and Bathsheba. He obviously was very good looking because Bathsheba was gorgeous and so David was a good looking man. And we'll see in the book how the women long for him. Uh, so as Elvis would say, he was a hunk of hunk of burning love. Uh, this is about the birds and the bees and the flowers and the trees and a thing called love, the whole book. But Solomon is mentioned seven times in uh, this book. And we think of Solomon as the one who was given wisdom by God. He built the temple. He had a prosperous reign, powerful, wealthy. He started out so well, God appeared to him twice and said, Solomon, what would you like? And he said, I need wisdom to rule your people. And God was so pleased with that, that he not only gave him wisdom, but he also gave him everything else. But here's the sad part. He began very well, but he ended poorly. And I think that's a warning to us. And if you go back and look at 1 Kings chapter 11, it says, King Solomon loved many foreign women and his, the women turned his heart from God. He even began worshiping the gods of these heathen tribes around him. So what a warning for us. You would think, now if God appeared to me, I'd always be on the straight and narrow. I'd never not serve him or love him. I'd never go off course. Well, that shows that isn't necessarily true. So the purpose of this book is to give a romantic love song between Solomon and the woman he loves, who we will call the Shulamite. This is divinely inspired love poetry. It celebrates sexual love. It shows the physical longings and cravings and desires that are God-given to be used within the bonds of marriage. The Bible says, uh, Peter did in 1 Peter, that we are heirs together of the grace of life. The marriage relationship is supposed to be the most wonderful relationship here on earth. It's a little bit of heaven right here on planet earth. And unfortunately, it doesn't always turn out that way. But think of this as an opera, as a play, a musical. Our main character, Solomon, who is called the Beloved. We have the Shulamite, who is from a town in Shulam. That's Lower Galilee. And she's a poor, hardworking girl. And then we have the Daughters of Jerusalem. So one will sing this part, one will sing that part, and then the chorus, the Daughters of Jerusalem, come in the background. I call them the doo-wops. So let's see how this uh, song unfolds. First, let's talk about how should we interpret though. Through the ages, 
initially the Jewish rabbis interpreted this as an allegory, okay? They said that the beloved represented is uh, God and the Shulamite represented the nation of Israel. When the church was first birthed, then it moved to that Christ is the beloved and we, the church, are the body of Christ. Charles Spurgeon took it this way. He was the prince of preachers for the 18th century um, in Victorian England, and he preached over 59 sermons on the Song of Solomon. Now, one way people deal with this book is just avoid it, ignore it. How many sermons have you heard on this topic? Probably not many, but today's biblical scholars do look at it more as a literal, straightforward description of romantic and sensual love between a man and a woman in marriage. Uh, John MacArthur, David Jeremiah, Charles Swindoll, they take this approach. That's how we're going to look at it today. You feel free to take whatever approach you want. And if you do take it allegorically, and we'll talk about some of those today, there's many, many points that can be made that way. We start with the courtship, then the wedding, and then the marriage. So let's begin. We observe it, we interpret it, and we seek to apply it. So chapter 1, verse 1, the Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. That's what the Hebrew said, uh, the Hebrew text, the Septuagint translated as the Song of Solomon. Both of them are correct. Now, when you repeat a word with that preposition of in the middle of it, it is showing emphasis and uh, supremacy. The song of all songs, just like Jesus is Lord of all lords, the king of all kings. It is the holy of all holies in the temple. Well, this is the best song Solomon wrote. He wrote 1005. It's the only one we have left. We don't have the music, but we do have the lyrics. So the song of all songs. And he, Solomon, is named six times in this uh, book. So let's read through. We'll make comments as we go along. I hope you'll get your Bible and follow along with me. The Shulamite begins. She speaks in this first uh, part that we're going to study today. Next week, Solomon will have more uh language given. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is better than wine. Because of the fragrance of your good ointments, your name is ointment poured forth. Therefore, the virgins love you. Draw me away. Remember the commercial Calgon, take me away. Well, she's saying, come get me. I want to be with you. Your kisses are the very best. You know, I love your fragrance. You just smell so good. And the young virgins love you. Everybody thinks Solomon, he's the man, he's the one. Oh, I wish he would look my way. Then the daughters of Jerusalem are the sh chime in and says, we're going to run after you. We want to chase you and just be around you. The Shulamite says, then the king has brought me into his chambers. And the daughters of Jerusalem say, oh, we're going to be glad and rejoice in you. It's like, you know, your girlfriends, you got the date with the, the quarterback and the good looking best student in the class. And everybody's saying, oh, I'm so happy for you. That's the daughters of Jerusalem. The doo-wops are back there saying, we're glad, we're happy for you. We will remember your love more than wine. Now the Shulamite speaks, rightly do they love you. But I am dark, but yet lovely, O daughters of Jerusalem, like the kents of Kedar, like the curtains of Solomon. Don't look upon me because I am dark, because the sun has tanned me. My mother's sons were angry with me. They made me the keeper of the vineyards, but my own vineyard I have not kept. What she's saying is, look, I know the upper crust. These women are fair. They don't have a tan because they didn't have to go out in the fields and work. I'm not rich like them, and my brothers made me go out and work in the field. So, you know, this is what I am. 
even though I'm tanned, though I, I do, I am lovely. So it wasn't anything to do with her race. It was the fact that she was poor and had to get out and work in the fields. Then to her beloved, she says, oh, tell me you who I love, where do you feed your flock? Where do you make it rest at noon? For why should I be as one who veils herself by the flocks of your companions? Now that's a veiled reference, veiled to a prostitute who they would veil themselves and sit out by the road waiting for someone to pick them up. Uh, we see this in Genesis 38. Tamar, who had been married to one of Judah's son and his wife died, uh, or her husband died, so Judah was supposed to give one of the brothers to Tamar to carry on the family name. He didn't do it, so she veiled herself, had intercourse with Judah. It, it's Go read it, okay? If you want to look at a soap opera, just read your Bible, because <laughs> it's all there, okay? And he answers her and says, If you don't know, O fairest among women, follow in the footsteps of the flock and feed your little goats beside the shepherd's tents. I've compared you, my love. Now listen to this. He's going to compliment her. And guys, I don't think this is the way we would say it today. Your woman would not want to hear it in this language. But at the time, this was considered a great compliment. I've compared you, my love, to my filly among Pharaoh's chariots. Your cheeks are lovely with ornaments, your neck with chains of gold. Now, Solomon loved horses, and if you've been to Israel, you can go and visit some of his stables. Uh, he obviously would have had the very best horse to, to uh, draw his chariot of any of them. And he says, you're just like the very, very best filly. And then he, she had on jewelry, the necklaces, the ornaments around her neck, the chains of gold. You know, I believe that we should do all we can to make our appearance presentable. We used to say, if the barn needs paint and paint it. So the Bible here, she was looking beautiful, but we don't put our trust in that outward beauty. It has to be the inward beauty of the heart. And the doo-wops come in here, the chorus. We'll make you ornaments of gold with studs of silver. And then the, she speaks, while the king is at his table, my spikenard sends forth its fragrance. So she says, look, I smell good. I've got on my perfume and it is sending its fragrance out. A bundle of myrrh is my beloved to me that lies all night between my breast. My beloved is to me a cluster of henna blooms in the vineyards of Angeti. In other words, he has fragrance also and this is her imagining you know like oh I, you know when you've been with someone and you just remember their smell and uh that if they're if you're separated that can make you feel close to them when you grab a sweater or a coat that he wore to be a reminder and feel like he's still there with you then the beloved speaks oh i did want to say angetti that is an oasis in the wilderness of Judea. If you go to Israel, and I've been, and I'm so thankful I was able to go, you can look out, and it's just sand, hills, as far as you can see. No greenery. It's just a desert. But there is one place, En Gedi, that has an oasis. David hid out there many times when Saul was... Uh, trying to hunt him down. So she, he's saying that this is, my beloved is a cluster of henna blooms, just like in Angeti. So that's a great compliment she's giving him. Now he speaks. So she's just given him these words of affection. He comes back and he says, Behold, you are fair, my love. Behold, you are fair. You have dove's eyes. I don't think we'd say it that way today, but that was a compliment. Now, uh, 10 times throughout the Song of Solomon, he's going to call her fair, beautiful, lovely. And 
24 times, she's going to call him my beloved. She got, she now chimes back in. Behold, you're handsome, my beloved. Yes, pleasant. Your bed is green. The beams of our house are cedar and our rafters are of fir. That gives a country uh, outdoor setting as a picnic, perhaps, where they're under the trees and they see the cedars and the firs, uh, the greenery of the forest. Now she speaks of herself. I am a rose of Sharon and the lily of the valleys. Now, an allegorical interpretation of that would apply that to Jesus, because we all know he's the lily of the valley. But actually, this is the Shulamite describing herself. These two flowers, the rose that grew in Sharon and the lily of the valleys, were not the most magnificent, gorgeous flowers. They were rather common. So basically, she is saying, you know, I'm not the most beautiful one. She's not propping herself up, you know, bragging about her beauty, but she's really saying, you know, I'm just a rose from Sharon. You know, I'm a common lily of the valley. But then she goes on, uh, or he begins. Chapter 2, we're at verse uh, 2. She's, he says, look, you may say that about yourself, but you are a lily among thorns. So is my love among the daughters. He's saying, compared to you, all those other girls look just like thorny bushes. The Shulamite then speaks, and she's going to compliment him. Like an apple tree among the trees of the woods, so is my beloved among the suns. I sat down in the shade with great delight, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. I loved being with you, and your kisses were just wonderful. The Shulamite then speaks to the daughters um, of Jerusalem, the chorus. He brought me to his banqueting table, and his banner over me is love. Well, that's another hymn. He brought me to his banqueting. But uh, she's saying that the king, Solomon, brought her to the banqueting table, the house of wine, and his banner over me was love. He is now publicly professing that this is the one for me. His banner over me, that's like putting down a stake with a flag and saying, here is my beloved. He's letting everyone know the Shulamite is for him. Um, and then goes on to say, refresh me because I am lovesick. Now, if you've ever been in love, those uh, first stages of infatuation, you just, oh, I can't be away from him this long. When is he going to call me? When can we get back together? His left hand is under my head and his right hand embraces me. I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or by the does of the field, do not stir up or awaken love until it pleases. This is a key verse in the entire book, and it's going to re be repeated three times. Do not awaken love until it pleases. In other words, that is, there is an appropriate time to awaken love for the stimulation, for the consummation of the uh, act of marriage, as Dr. Tim Hay used to call it. And it's not wise to stir this up when you know it's against God's will to go ahead and be and have sexual relations outside of marriage. This book teaches virginity and chastity. Later on, we don't see it today, but she describes herself or he describes her as a garden enclosed, a fountain sealed. In other words, she had saved herself for him. I used to tell my girls, there's one gift you can give to one person one time, and that's your virginity. And so the Song of Solomon shows this exclusivity uh, that you are the one I love and there is no one else for me. I am my beloved and my beloved is mine. 
uh, if you look over at the Shulamite speaking in verse 46, I'm hurrying along and skipping things because I think my time's about <laughs> to go out. That you are the only one for me. God's design for marriage was one man, one woman for life. Not one man and one man. or <laughs> God gave us the definition of marriage. Uh, the two shall become one flesh. And we cannot change the definition of marriage. We may say, well, you know, this homosexual couple got married. Well, not in reality, not according to God who gave us the definition of marriage. And only he uh, can state what it is. So... It's, it's not a marriage unless it's one man, one woman for life. Not till you don't make me happy anymore. Not till, well, I found my real soulmate. Not till, well, I don't love you anymore. No, you work it out. You get through it. So there is a security that is found when you says, I am my beloved. He wants me. He loves me. And my beloved is mine. That is just so wonderful, a piece of heaven here on earth. And that's how it is to be. Now, I wanted to go back in chapter one because I skipped over this. She says, uh, rise up, my love, my fair one. I'm in verse uh, 16 and 17. Lo, the winter is past, the rain is come and gone, the flowers appear on the earth, and the time of singing has come. That is a great passage if you want to pull some principles from it. The winter is past. It's gone. The rain is over. You know, there are things in our life we just need to say, that's gone, that's past. You can't change the past. Right here, right now is what I'm dealing with. And the flowers are now appearing. The time of the singing of birds has come. It's springtime. Springtime, we think of new life. There are times in our life when we have to say goodbye to the past, whether we want to or not. Sometimes we do want to. Sometimes we wish we could just cling to it, but we can't. It's over. We need to move forward. That's what Paul said in Philippians. He says, forget the things that are past. I press on for the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So I, I, I love that passage. And that would be a more allegorical setting uh, for that interpretation for that. Now, if you continue, let's go to chapter three. We've got those first five verses. By night on my bed, but basically she's having a bad dream, okay? And she's going to, she seeks her beloved. I'll rise and go to the city in the streets and I will seek for him. And the watchman found me and I said, have you seen the one I love? And they said, no, scarcely have I passed by when I found the one I love. I held on to him and would not let him go. And then if you see verse five, here's the same thing we saw in chapter two. I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or the does of the field, do not stir love until it pleases. Now, when she says, I charge you, she is saying, look, make me accountable. I want you to hold me to it. That I will be pure until we get married. And that's, we all need accountability. We all have weak spots and we need friends to help hold us accountable. Now that's where it ends for us today. And I hate that because it goes on and gets even better as you conclude. And you'll have to tune in for next week's lesson to get that. But here's what I want us to take away from this. Uh, God puts the highest, or uh, what should I say? God puts the highest regard on marriage because it is a picture of Christ and the church. God ordained marriage at the very beginning. He defines it. And, you know, you can call this a marriage to men, to women, but I can call a rose a daisy. That doesn't make it so. It is a marriage only, man, one man, one woman for life. Now, within the marriage context, Hebrews tells us that 
Marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. There is a commitment to one another. You don't let your eyes look at other women guys. Women, you don't go daydream about that good looking guy over down at the store. You keep your self viewed at to one another. Now today, marriage has really fallen uh, aside in many relationships. In 1960, 72% of people were married that were over the age of 18. Today, only about 50% get married. And we know that about 50% get divorced, even in the church. Now, I don't think Solomon had to deal with divorce. He just added another one to the harem. Maybe he never called for him to come into uh, the, the room where he was ruling. But we have so many children today who are being raised in homes that don't have a mother and a father. And you know that affects how society is uh, going. As goes the home, so goes the family. So we really need to do all we can to promote marriage, to be exclusive for each other. Uh, if you go back to chapter three, Four times there, have I sought the one I love. The next verse, I will seek the one I love. The next verse, have you seen the one I love? When I found the one I love. This is not to be many involved. We are exclusive. One plus one equals ones. Sex outside of marriage is a cheap substitute. It is fool's gold, it's a counterfeit, it's a fake, it's a sham, and all it does is leave the person with regrets, guilt, bad memories, and possibly even sexual diseases. So we keep ourselves true to one another. Marriage involves making a vow, which is much stronger than just a promise. It is a commitment for life. And anybody who's been married knows that in the rocky times, and we all have had them, that it is the commitment, the vow that you made to God. Because God, I believe, will hold people accountable who break their vows. Uh, nobody seems to care about it today, but God does. And in fact, Solomon said it's better not to make a vow than to make one and bre break it in the book of uh, Ecclesiastes. Now, let me quickly say, I sit here as one who's been through it all, not by my own choice, but you know, when you fill out an application and it says uh, status, single, married, widowed, divorced, I can say check to all of them. And so this is not a condemnation if we, you've gone through the tragedy of a divorce or if you have been lost someone in some way, but this is the ideal, what God wants. And even Solomon didn't keep the idea, even after God appeared to him. So to those of us who say, I hold to a biblical view of marriage today, we're considered intolerant, bigoted, homophobic, and may have a backlash because of that. But marriage is God's ideal. Sexual union within marriage is good, God says. It was his idea. He's the one who made us and gave us the hormones that uh, get so excited in the act of marriage. But it has to be in marriage. That's why we don't have extramarital affairs. It's like fire that is magnificent when it cooks your food or warms your home, but horrible when it is out of control and burns up the forest and your home. The nuclear power, wonderful to give us energy to make our lives better, but if it explodes, it's death for thousands. So that's another point we want to make. It has to be exclusive. I would also say, don't let the romance slip away. How many times do they compliment 
each other. And we need to make a point of doing that in our relationships today. Tell that woman she looks good. Tell him, oh, I'm so glad I married you. Uh, don't let it slip away. You know, there's a joke about the old man who uh, the wife said, honey, why don't you ever tell you tell me you love me anymore? And he said, look, I told you when we got married, and if I change my mind, I'll let you know. Well, women like to hear it. This also shows that we should take care of ourselves, make ourselves as attractive as possible. And then the verse that the little foxes spoil the vineyard. I meant to bring that out in verse chapter 2, verse 15. Catch the little foxes that spoil the vines, for our vines have tender grapes. What are the little foxes that maybe are hindering your relationship? Is it selfishness or pride or refusing to say I'm sorry or being so critical of each other's faults? And we all know that when we get married, we find these little uh, uh, ways that our mate just annoys us. You know, why does he have to slurp his coffee like that? Why does he have to leave the garage door up so everybody can see all of our junk? Why can't he pick up his clothes and put them in the dirty clothes basket? On and on. Keep the big picture in mind. These are little things. If you've got a good man or a good wife, compliment them, love them, and learn to overlook some of these uh, minor flaws and annoyances. So, in summary, marriage is God's physical good gift to mankind. It is a picture of God's great love for us. So, we are to cherish and honor one another, serve one another, and find that little piece of heaven on earth. Now, let me say, for those of us who are single, you say, well, what about me? Well, God wants us to find our fulfillment in our relationship with Christ and serving him. Paul tells us, 1 Corinthians 7, he was single. He wished all men were as he is was. And it gives us a lot more freedom in our service because we are not bound to the things of the home, which are necessary when you're married. And, you know, if marriage is in God's plan for you, wait on him. He'll bring you the right one. Thank you so much. I hope you'll find this uh, helpful. I'm sorry I had to rush through it, but uh, that's all the time we've got. See you next time. Bye.